I'll be reading James chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be kind, uh, that we should be a kind of first fruits for his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive the meekness, the implant, the meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. You would please be seated. Good morning. Pleasure to see you today, and I'm thankful that we can be together and that we can give God our glory and honor in all that we are seeking to do as we worship him this morning. <clears throat> We all have a button. It's not a button that you have on your clothes. It's something deep within us. And it is a gatekeeper, if you will, that when someone does or says enough to agitate, to test, to prod you, they, we use the term, they are pushing my button. And when that happens, the gate is released and all... That's all right, just leave it there, it's fine, it's fine. All of that anger just keeps pouring out. Usually, there's a particular person, maybe more, and it doesn't matter if your button is buried deep within or whether you wear it on your sleeve, they have a particular skill to be able to push your button. So how do we handle when people push our buttons? What are we to do? How do we handle the anger? I thought this might be beneficial for us as we talked last week about how to handle disagreements. I thought it would be helpful for us to then look at, okay, well, how do we handle anger? And how is it connected to God's Word? So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to James chapter 1. And verses 18 through 21, that will be our text for this morning. And as you look at that, at least for me, as I read that, it seems like verse 18 and verse 21, they go together. They're tied together. And verse 19 and 20 seem to go together. But the question then is, okay, well, how do all of those relate together? Well, let's notice what James is saying here. James is starting off and he's telling us that we were reborn. And he's making a contrast here. In verse 15, he's talking about the temptation. And he says that, that, that lust, when it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Well, James is using the same words there, that idea of bring forth but he says in verse 18, he says that God brought you forth. That word bring forth is really one word in the Greek that means to generate or to bring new life, to, to make or to be born again is really the idea that he's saying there. And so he says how he has done it. He has done it by the word of truth, the gospel, the, the good news about Jesus. But he goes further then in verse 21, and he says that the word has been planted within you. Well, what word is he talking about? Well, it's the word of truth. God's will, God's mind, his heart that he revealed through written words, he's saying that is now inside you. If you are born again, 
then that word has been planted within you. And so he's saying then that by being implanted or planted in us, that it is now something that is natural. It's not acquired. If you uh, read a book and, and you gain some knowledge from that book, you, you have acquired that knowledge. But if it is something within you, it is something that is bringing life, that's the idea that he's talking about here. That God's truth and power have been, we might say, grafted into us by the Spirit. And so God's Word, which created us and brought us to new life, is now the means by which we can grow and become the image of Christ. To grow into, as he'll talk about in just a, a few verses down, the law of liberty. So the idea that we can have freedom from sin. And so he's saying all of this is what you have now within you. But if we're honest with ourselves, we look at ourselves and say, wait a minute. If I've been reborn, if I've got divine power in me, why haven't I changed that much? What's limiting me from, from, from exuding all of this divine power? And James is dealing with that very thing. He says that there is something that is slowing our progress. He said, we are told that we are to receive the word implanted in us. But there's something that's hindering in that. And in verses 19 and 20, notice what he says there. He says, this you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For, anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, again, it seems like verse 18 and verse 21, they flow together. We're talking about the Word of God. But then he comes to verse 19 and 20. He's like, wait a minute, we're talking about anger? How, how do those two things go together? Well, he's saying here, there is a contrast between anger and listening. And James says, don't be the angry person, be the listening person. Think about if you are a listening person, you accept and you are receptive to what others say. But the one who is angry tries to control the situation. They say, it is going to be this way, it is going to be my way or else. That's the angry person. And so James is saying here, the reason the word is not changing us more is because we have an angry spirit. The reason why the world is not liberating us from our sin more is because we have an angry spirit. Think about it. The same spirit that you have in your relationships is the same spirit that you really have in your walk with Christ. And so if you are someone who, who doesn't listen to others because of anger, well, you won't listen to God. If you fail to be receptive to what others say about you, then you're going to fail to listen to what God has to say about you. What James is saying here is the humble listener to others will be a humble listener to God's Word. Well, he's, he's putting it out there for us. It's the anger. So let's talk about anger. How do we handle this anger? What are the implications of it? Well, notice first what he says here. Anger is by its nature not bad or sinful. He doesn't say don't be angry. He says don't be quick to anger. And as in Ephesians chapter Four and verse 26, there Paul says, be angry and do not sin. So anger in and of itself is not a bad thing. It is, in fact, it is a godlike reaction. 
Think about what we see throughout God's Word. In Exodus 15 and verse 7, this, this is uh, after God has dealt with Israel. He's brought them through the Red Sea, and now the Egyptians have been overthrown. They have been covered up by the Red Sea, and the Israelites are singing this song of praise, and in it they say, and in the greatness of your excellence you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them like chaff. We see a little bit further in Numbers that now this anger is directed towards Israel. In Numbers 32 and verse 13 it says, So Yahweh's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the entire generation of those who had done evil in the sight of Yahweh was destroyed. We see Jesus in his ministry, God angry. He went into the temple. He was overturning tables. I don't think he was just doing that, just like, oh, yeah, let me overturn that table. Oh, yeah, let me do that. I think he, there, there, was, there was a sense of anger. He was probably throwing the tables over. He got angry. That is a God-like reaction. So if that is the case, then, what does that mean for us? I like the way that one man defined it, he defined anger this way. He said, it is energy released to defend or preserve something or someone. Energy released to, to defend or preserve something or someone. Think about it. When Jesus saw someone hurt, he got angry and he defended them. If he saw truth being maligned, he got angry and he sought to preserve truth. Anger is not wrong because it is the means or it is the help to defend what is good, honorable, and beautiful when we might not do otherwise. For example, let's think about maybe someone in your family or, or a friend of yours, you see injustice done to them. Maybe it's your child. Maybe you, you see someone, some huge person coming up and hitting your child. You get angry about it. And you go up to them and you say, don't do that. Stop doing that. It's the anger that is motivating you to go and do that. Whereas otherwise, you would say, that person is, is, is double my size. I'm not going to go up against that person. But it's because you are seeking to defend your child, that anger motivates you to do something that you might not otherwise do. James, though, is talking about when that anger has gone bad. That unrighteous anger, as he talks about there in verse 20. So how do you know if your anger has gone bad? Well, he tells us. One, he says that bad anger flares up quickly. Notice what he says there in verse 19. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Bad anger flares up quickly. At the, we say at the drop of a hat. Doesn't matter what happens, you, you just, you're ready to fly off the handle. That's a sign of bad anger. Another sign is that it leads you to regret things afterwards. Good anger, or righteous anger as we're calling it, is something that after it has happened, after the event has happened, and you're contemplating, you're thinking about it, you feel good that you did that. Unrighteous anger is such that when the thing has passed and you're reflecting on it, you're like, oh man, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Why did I do that? That's that kind of bad anger that, that James is, is talking about here. Think about it this way. As James is pointing out these things to us, what is the opposite of anger? Now, we might jump to it and say, okay, opposite of anger, self-control. That's what I need. I need self-control. That's not what he's saying here. 
It's not that you seek to just control your anger, that you tell yourself, okay, you know what, I blew up that time, I just got to be better about it, I'm not going to get angry, I'm not going to get angry, I'm not going to get angry. That's not the way to handle it. That's not the opposite. What he says here is that the opposite of anger is humility. He says, humbly accept the word that has been implanted in you. When humble, we are willing to listen to others. So what does that mean then? It means that the cause of our sinful anger is pride. If you don't get anything else out of my thoughts this morning, out of of the words that I say, hone in on this. The cause of our sinful anger is pride. Whether it's inward anger, as we're talking about maybe bitterness or holding a grudge, or it's outward anger where you are just letting it explode, you're yelling, you're, you know, there's malice, there's all of that. Either one of those, we have to address our pride. And I think this really gets to the heart of what pushes our button. What, what really makes us, what sets us off? When someone pushes that button, it is understanding that anger becomes sinful when it is released to defend our pride. Good anger says, I'm going to be released to defend something that is good and right and just. Sinful anger says, I'm going to be released to defend pride. I'm going to be released to defend my self-image that we can't let anybody else destroy. Think about it. We have an image of ourselves that is set pretty much in stone. We, We see ourselves a certain way. And when other people start maybe agitating us, stirring us up, maybe calling us into question, calling our image into question, we try to preserve it. Think for just a moment. Sinful anger usually arises when we are trying to control what we cannot control or trying to preserve the image that we have of ourselves. Let's try to think about that. Let's think about what is road rage? What really is that? It is someone who has gotten upset, gotten angry over something they have no control over. I can't control the other driver, but I think I should have. Therefore, I have gotten angry over what I expected to happen. And so now I'm lashing out at someone else. You see, the problem with all of that is that we don't accept the image of self in the gospel. The gospel says that we are a totally loved moral failure. Now think about that. Each and every one of us is totally loved moral failure. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says so. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's the love. God begins with it. He shows, he demonstrates his love. When did he love us? Not when we came up to his standard. We've totally missed his standard. We've messed up. We are a moral failure. But in Jesus Christ, we are totally loved. But because of our moral failure, it required nothing less than the death of Jesus Christ so that we can be saved from sin. See, an angry person can't reconcile those two things in his heart. An angry person denies the failure. You see, think about it. 
If you're an angry person and someone tries to point something out to you, tries to point maybe one of your faults or maybe just a, a different way of doing things, the angry person will lash out. Why? Because they will not admit their fault. Haven't you ever been around somebody who's like that? And they say, it's not my fault, it's your fault. Or it's their fault. Or if, we're, if they're really bold, they'll say, it's God's fault, but it's not my fault. See, they're not, they're not, they have an image of self that is not the same as what we see in the gospel. They can't reconcile both of those. They can't admit moral failure because then that means that they would not be loved. You see, they either think, okay, I have to prove myself so that I can be loved or there's failure. The Bible says you're both. You are completely loved and you are a moral failure. But that's okay because of what Jesus has done for us. And so the reason that we blow up, the reason that we hold a grudge, the reason that we try to control, the reason why we can't take criticism comes down to our self-righteousness, our pride. Because the reality is that we have not, or let's put it this way, we've forgotten how much we've been forgiven in Jesus Christ. If I am mad at somebody else for pointing out something that I did or didn't do, that in some way mars the image that I have of myself, I'm missing it. Because think about it in this way. You can't think of your debt to Jesus and someone's el- someone else's debt to you at the same time. You can't reflect on how much you have missed the mark with Jesus and think about that other person and what they've done to you at the same time. Not really. Because what that requires is if I am thinking about my debt and realizing what God has done, how he has forgiven all of that, it humbles me. It says, wow, I'm not worthy of anything. And yet he still has done this. You see, when you see your debt that has been forgiven, You can't stay angry at the other person. You have to let it go. Now, all of us get angry. All of us, at times, have our button pushed. What are we to do? I think the key is that we, one, see that we are a complete moral failure, but we are completely loved at the same time. And then ask ourselves, when I get angry, what am I defending? Is it my image of self that I have? Or am I defending that which is good and right and just? Because if the image of myself is not in line with what the gospel is, then something's wrong there. The gospel says, you've messed up, but you're completely loved. He says that we need to humbly receive God's word. And that's the challenge, I think, for us. There is so much of the time where we're not willing because I don't want God to tell me what I've done wrong. I don't want to read that passage, or, or I want to stay away from that one. I like this one over here, but not this one, because eh, it really steps on my toes. Well, why is that? It's because I have the wrong image of self. And I'm not letting God in. I'm not going to let God tell me what I need to hear. 
Well, let's wrap this up. And I want to give you three things that would help us to see our pride. I didn't come up with these, but I think they're, they are very helpful. The first thing is, a proud heart is sure of every point of its belief. Now, it's one thing to know what you believe and realize that you don't know everything. Let me say that again. It's one thing to know what you believe, but realize that you do not know everything. Because what that then opens you up to is to say, okay, my, my understanding can change. My perspective can be changed. I will hold to what I know to be true, but if I see in a different light, then I'm willing to say, I didn't see that in the right way. I need to change things. The proud heart says, nah, I am holding to every point of my belief in that that they see it doesn't make a difference between what we might say a major point and a minor point. Because every belief to the proud heart is a major belief because it is their belief. Let me try to explain this in, a, in one way. Last week we talked about Romans 14. And Paul was going through that and saying, look, there's going to be somebody who says, hey, I, I can eat this, this meat. And somebody else says, no, 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 I can't eat that. Okay? The proud heart is the one who comes along and says, no, it doesn't matter. It is my way or the highway. This is right. It doesn't matter. Paul's saying, well, hold up, back up. You need to see the other person rather than just what you're holding as your belief. It's not about what you believe. It's about them and helping them grow. But the proud heart says, it is my way. Because here's the thing. They can't separate between what we might say is a major belief and a minor belief because if one of their beliefs falls, changes, if you will, then all of their beliefs comes falling down. That's the proud heart. Second thing to see, our pride. The proud heart enjoys confronting or avoids confronting, but never confronts with tears. You see, the proud heart is desperately trying to hold up their self-image, their righteousness, to defend their spotless self-image, at least what they are portraying to the world. And what they do is they do one of two things. Either they love to confront someone else. They love to get into that, that debate and exchange and, and because what they're trying to do is say, you're wrong, let me show you how wrong you are because if I can tell you you're wrong, that elevates me. That makes me feel good about who I am. That's the confronter. But the proud heart is also one who is the avoid, the one who avoids confrontation in that, that they don't want to be criticized. They're fearful of somebody else criticizing them, pointing out their failures, and so they avoid it at all cost. What's, what's the reality of what we should be? The humble person says, I am to speak God's word in God's love. That's what we're to do. And so I'm coming and I'm, and I'm going to show, hey, this is what God's word says. And, and it doesn't seem like you are, are going that direction, but I'm not about me. I'm not about trying to build myself up. I'm coming to them sometimes even in tears because I'm worried about them rather than myself. That's the difference between the proud heart and the humble heart. And the last step or, or point that I think we can see is that a proud heart is always unhappy with life. 
The proud heart is always griping and complaining about the way that life is. And here's, here's the distinction. A humble heart comes along and life just is terrible for them. But instead of getting upset, the humble heart says, you know what? Even though I may not like this, I recognize that God knows better than I do. And so instead of saying, why is all of this happening to me? The humble heart comes back and says, I need to see what God is trying to teach me. I need to see what am I to learn in this situation. The proud heart's completely different. Proud heart is always complaining. My life isn't what it should be. My life is always messed up. Never, nothing good ever happens to me. Well, what's the problem there? They think that they know what their life should be. They think they know what is best for their life, even to the point that they think they know better than God what is best for them. And so their life is always going to be one of griping and complaining because they think they know what is best. What does James tell us? What's the answer to our pride? He says, there is power in you. If you have been reborn, there is power to change your pride. But what we have to do is be willing, humbly, to accept that word and let that power change us. Will your button be pushed from time to time? Sure. But what you will see happen over time is that your button will be pushed for different reasons. That it's no longer about you defending your self-image. You get angry over things that make God angry. And you defend the things that God defends and preserves. To see that which is good and honorable and beautiful in God's sight. But how does that begin with each and every one of us saying, I am completely loved, and yet I am a complete moral failure? None of us get it right. It doesn't matter how good I am in one area, I can always find a, a way to, to show myself better than, than you in one area, but guess what? There's going to be failures in another area. I, I am a broken person. You are a broken person. And it only gets better through the grace of Jesus Christ. So I ask you this morning, are you challenged with anger? Are you struggling with anger? God is giving us a way to deal with that. And it's through Jesus Christ. If you're not a child of God this morning, what's holding you back? He's calling out to you. He says, I want to make you new like you've never been before. I want to give you the power to be something that I have always intended you to be. But we have to be willing to let go of our pride and humbly come before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning, can we help you? As I just continue to re reiterate to all of us, we are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We are broken. But we know what the world doesn't in that we have found our help in Jesus Christ, and we want that for everyone. And so God's invitation is open to you this morning. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?